Uh, I'd like to introduce Maxwell Fenton, uh, who's come over from the UK to give a talk on SurrealDB. Uh, he's working uh, with that company on AI projects. And so this project is about how they used uh, Rust bindings to connect to a Python application. So really looking forward to this talk. As usual, I'd like to thank uh, Martin Mayer for giving us the office here today. Um, and with no further ado, I will introduce Matthew, and here we go. All right. Thanks. So, um, hi. So, I'm Max Offlin. I'm just uh, rearranging this. So, just get my laptop in. There we are. So, um, so for, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm a software engineer at SurrealDB, and uh, this is the the uh, Amazon kind of page. So, I've written the book in um, Rust and Web Programming, and I've also written the book on Speed Up Your Python with Rust, which is what this main talk is about. And uh, currently writing the O'Reilly book on async Rust, uh, which is quite exciting. So I'm writing that with Caroline Morton on how to build your own async runtimes. So um, without further ado, so our talk really is on the pros and cons of Rust, really. Well, really just the pros and uh, how Rust is safer and how it compares to other languages and how we actually confuse it with, with Python to build um, modules that can be installed with pip. And uh, also how we built this, we use pip and so on, how to build um, the, the Rust client, essentially. So uh, we are talking about the pros and cons because, you know, some of the, there's a lot of people here who most probably know about Rust and why it's really good, and that's a Rust meetup. Um, but we also have to cover, you know, stuff from people who are going into Python um, or coming from Python. They uh, will want to know why they should really be doing Rust. So Rust really is um, very performant. You don't really need a runtime. You can just compile it and run it. It has no garbage collection, so it's very fast. And it's suitable for embedded systems as well. So you can also embed these into like chips and into into certain I/O devices, you know, uh, IoT devices, and it just runs. <clears throat> they also have, has a very rich type system, and uh, you can com you you have these compile checks as well when you kind of run this and um, when you're compiling the code, and uh, it guarantees memory safety even though it doesn't have a garbage collection, and that's kind of insane, right? So so when we think about that, we have uh, great control and performance. But we also have safety, and obviously this graph is not, you know, to scale. There's no scale there, really. But it's to illustrate the point that Rust really gives you this safety and also this speed. And we're going to look at safety in terms of comparing it to Python right now, right? So looking at this, people can also say, like, well, my Python code is memory safe. So what's the issue with this? Like, why can't I uh, just use Python? And, and this is a really good example that I always use when I'm talking to Python developers. And um, this is here where we have a object, and we call it dangerous, because in this code it's going to be dangerous. And um, we create an instance of it. Then we create two dictionaries. And then you can see with these dictionaries, we insert the instance of dangerous into both of them. Then we update the value for one in one dictionary. And then, and to the Rust developers, these are hash maps. And then we print them both. And you can see that they're both updated. They've both got the same memory address, and they're both updated. And what's happening here is they're both pointing to the same instance in memory, which is kind of unexpected. It doesn't, you know, Python's not telling you it's doing this. And uh, to make it even more inconsistent, if you use data primitives like integers, this behavior won't actually happen. So what you actually get is this kind of undefined behavior in certain edge cases, and you don't really know it's happening. Uh, until you kind of inspect it, which kind of makes it dangerous even though it's memory safe. Um, now we can compare that to, let's say, Rust. And with Rust, we try and do the same thing. We create a struct this time, we call it dangerous, and then we try and create it, um, and then we insert it into the hash map. And you can see that you get an error in compile time. And it's saying, look, we, you can't do this. The value has moved. So you one hash map has consumed it, so the other hash map can't control it. And you either have to clone it or you have to explicitly reference it. And this is really just saving you a headache later on. This is saving you some sort of, you know, bug that you, or edge case that you didn't really see coming. So um, going on to that, it's not just references in memory. Another really good example when we look at, at Python is this screenshot of um, Stack Overflow. And okay, it's uh, five years old, but these things still happen 
in and out, you know, throughout the time. So what we see here is somebody looping through and they're adding to their strings in Python. And they're saying, why is this so slow? And then the, the approved answer is, well, actually, if you put them in an array and then you join them at the end, it'll be much faster. And they're saying that strings are immutable. Now, in Rust, you kind of just get this forced into your into your head, right? It's right in your face. If you try and pass a string or the, the data of the string directly for a function, it will refuse to compile and it'll say, we don't know the size of compile time. But Python's kind of just sweating under the hood and saying, okay, you want to do that? Well, Python can't break the laws of computer science. It will just reallocate the memory constantly in these loops and just not tell you about it. So we get a lot of, um, you know, there's more to safety than just memory safety, is, it, is what we're saying here. Um, and now we're kind of convinced you that, you know, Python's really not the safest. I still use Python, I'm not hating on it, but um, it's nice to have these explicit things in Rust. We can move on to the next thing, this is what we call traits. And again, I apologize to people who are already familiar with Rust, but to the Python engineers, um, this is quite an important concept as well. You, you may have heard uh, on the internet, you may have read on the internet, that Rust takes a lot longer to code. And um, in some aspects, this is kind of true, but not really. Um, and traits here is what we're really gonna show you. So you can see that we're gonna implement what we call generic traits. And we have a write and we have a read and we have a show data. And the T is kind of like the generic value. So when we're compiling the Rust code, the compiler will go through all the implementations of your traits and compile for specific ones that you've used for the specific data types, which is, uh, which is really useful. So when we go through this, we can implement, let's say, a file handle. And we've got a read of I32. Um, and then we have an increase count and we have a show data. And these are all just very generic placeholders. With, this is just an example. Um, and then let's say that we also going to have a HTTP handle and we we add the write to this for the I32. And it's just printing it out because we're not actually doing HTTP for this example. So what we actually get now is we have a function called increase by one. And you can see here that we're being very specific with the traits that we're allowing into the code. So, or into the function, sorry. So for our reader, that has to implement the I32 read, it has to implement the increase count trait, and it also has to increase, implement the show data trait. And then for the writer, it just has to implement the write trait. And then you can see that we do these functions here, and then it works, right? And we get this print at the bottom right. The cool thing about this is that this is almost like surgical inheritance, right? So what we have in this sense is um, we, when we look at like traditional inheritance, we could say, oh, we have a, we have a player, we have an orc, we have a human and we have an elf, uh, elf. And what we could essentially do with these is they could inherit from a player, you know, object. And this means that you could have HP and you could deal damage and take damage. And then you have a function that says take damage and deal damage if you're doing a game. Um, but then we get into some problems because we could theoretically have a house that would uh, take damage, but it doesn't mean that it deals damage and it doesn't have all the attributes that a player has. So we're into some sticky te territory and this is where the traits really set on fire. So, so we can see if we reimagine this increase counter by one function and we have a deal damage for T and a take damage for X, we can create any sort of struct. And as long as it makes sense for that trait to happen, they can play together. So this is really powerful in this sense, right? So the myth that I really want to kind of bust is that you have to write a lot of code and it's very verbose. It's very expressive and direct of what you're doing with the code and the memory, but it doesn't mean you have to write a ton of boilerplate code. It just means you have to be explicit what you're actually doing. So hopefully I'm convincing some of these Python developers that you can write some really good code and fuse it with Python, which is obviously what this talk is about. So we just go for one more. And uh, this here is code that we really have for, you know, deriving out of the box traits. So, so this is an example where we have like a database and it's a, it's a user model in a database and we have the queryable, the clone, the identifiable, 
traits and we just decorate that and we say okay it's gonna have that and then we also have like the serialized trait from CERD and this is deserialized and serialized the, the struct and we could just decorate the user with that as well so if it passes through a function and uh, you need to serialize it to JSON it would just automatically do that which is pretty cool again you're writing much less code in the long run but I don't want to pass in the the password so you can see that I manually implement the serialize here and I don't have the password in there and you can see here that just kind of like the surgical inheritance with traits where you can be very specific about what your structs do you can also be very specific about how you implement those traits as well which is also pretty cool out of the box traits you can just you can choose just to blanket you know implement them if you need to and you can choose to be very specific in how they're implemented so again it's a lot of control if you want it but again not much code and this will just get fired anywhere that you put it through so it makes web development really good so me personally I used to write a lot of Python Flask apps and now I write a lot of Attics web Rust apps and I end up writing less code in general using Py uh, Attics web Rust than I do Python Flask which is kind of insane but this is really how powerful traits are so we're going to go to one more thing and we want to go into what we call fearless concurrency and because we have to be so expressive with with what we're actually doing in terms of the types and the lifetimes um, and we can and and the traits we can actually write our own custom async runtimes with rust and we can be really safe with it and this is where we get the fearless concurrency so so this is a really simple example of how to actually build an async runtime <clears throat> so we have the future and we have that trait and it's again for a generic part we have the send trait which means it can be sent over the the thread it has a static because it has a static lifetime so that means that the future may never be you know you may you may never hold the main thread to completion um, for for the future that you're that you're polling the async task so throughout the whole of the program so you you have to have the lifetime to be the entire length of the program and then for our task, again, we have to have the send because we send it back over the thread and then we have a static lifetime. And then what we have is we have a lazy static that gets evaluated once and never again, no matter how many times you call this function. And then we pass in tasks through a flume channel so they queue and then we schedule them and run them. And that's it. That code there is all you need to build your own async runtime. That was a basic runtime. But that's pretty insane, right? And that is safe. You know that you're not going to get memory leaks. You know that you're not going to get double freeze. You know with the borrow checker that everything is going to be safe. So you can start to delve down into really cool like you know, tasks that low-level C programmers would do and a lot of other people wouldn't want to touch because it's just not that safe. So we've got to somebody else coming in and and we can see on the bottom right is how we implement a future and you implement your own custom poll and uh, this one's just a basic count and you pass in your waker and stuff and it's pending or it's polling now we're rushing through this this talk is not on async so don't feel bad if you walk away and you think oh gosh I can't write an async runtime after listening to this it's just a demonstration of how powerful rust is and then we can create our own macros and then we can start to have our own uh, futures and we put the we spawn the tasks and then we wait for them and it, and that's essentially it right so again don't focus too much on the specifics of async rust it's just more of a demonstration of how powerful rust is and how you can do so much with just a few lines of code so we just need to recap really why so why is rust awesome i think we've, we've concluded that it's super safe we've shown that with the dictionaries right so we've shown that compared to python where we're being very explicit on if we're copying it or if there's going to be another reference to it and it won't let you just do things without you knowing um we're also quite fine-grained so we can be very high level implementations and we can dive into the low level implementations that's pretty cool it's interoperable we'll cover some of this and it's this, the studies show from AWS that it's second only to C for energy efficiency, which 
again, who doesn't like low serve accounts, right? So it's also very fast and we've got that fearless concurrency. And we'll start to talk about some things that we've done in Rust. So now we're hopefully juiced up and then we'll cover actually how to write, fuse up our Python with Rust. So first one is clinical metrics and uh, this is something that I built with a friend. Um, the German government wanted some medical simulation you know, um, software a couple of years ago, as we all know, it was a very interesting time. And um, these are all the servers and they're all written in Rust. Databases aren't written in Rust, they're standard databases, but we initially wrote them in Python and after a while they started to fall over when they got more and more traffic because we had heavy amounts of traffic going in. And this was kind of like a side project that me and my friend were building and we started slowly converting them all over to, to Rust servers and you know, the, the writing was better, there was no bugs because the compile, you know, the, the compiler kind of caught them all. And uh, because we implemented our traits properly, we ended up running less code than we did in Python. And it's running now, and it's still running, you know, and we do it at the weekends, and it's just become easier and easier. Um, the other one is my, my, you know, day job, and this is SurrealDB. And SurrealDB is a database that kind of, you can run it in the cloud and it scales, or you can run it on a node, or you can run it locally, which I guess with Docker is not a huge boast, but you can also run it embedded, or you can run it in the browser. And that's because Rust is highly interoperable, especially with Wasm. And uh, we get to do all these really cool features with Rust, um, with, with SurrealDB, because it's written in Rust. So I've recently announced that we've deploying, uh, we've got machine learning deployments in, in a database. And we're using certain bindings, and we're building our own file format. And it just kind of works because, well, it's built in Rust. We're building our own key, key value store. And again, it's because it's written in Rust, we're building our own async runtimes. As you saw how fearless concurrency works, we would be able to develop stuff at much faster rates than the traditional C databases. So hopefully now, the uh, Rust developers are less, they're no longer going to be bored because you already knew all this anyway. And the Python developers and other developers are like, great, how do we get Rust into our systems? Or how do I fuse it with Python? And the simplest one we can initially do is piping data between programs. So what we have here is a very simple one where we have a Python script first and it kind of just prints out some integers. And then we've got the pipe this is in, in the terminal. Then we have a cargo run on the, the Rust one, which kind of has the STD in, it accepts some data, and it, it doubles them, uh, and you know times them by two, and then it prints them out again. And then we have the last one, which is just another Python script, and it just gets them from the STD in and prints them. And as you, if you see here in the slide, you can see that it's doubled them all, right? So we have a load of inputs, from test.py and then test2.py, we have the outputs and they've all been doubled. And this is probably the simplest way to structure um, or to fuse two languages. I mean, it has its limitations. It's not very development friendly, but <clears throat> it's very easy and it's very lightweight. So when I was working on a financial loss calculation system that NASDAQ was using for, for risk, we had to shift terabytes of data and piping was pretty much the best option. It wasn't the most high tech, it didn't look really cool, but we had to have like tons of data in binary files and uh, because a database query was just too slow and um, we had to chunk these files and we had to read them at certain points. Piping was a dream for this. But, okay, we've got the pipe, piping done, no worries. Um, we're gonna go forward to our basic pip outline and this is actually how we built the SurrealDB um, client. So there's, uh, there's, there's, there's quite a bit on here, but it's hard to like fit it all in. So we can see here that on our left, we've got like the Python code. This is the structure that we have for our Python package. In the middle is the SRC. We will then have like um, all the Rust code. So the, here we have our librs, which is what the you know the export code for the library, and then we have our operations, 
uh, which have our authentication because we're going to be logging into SurrealDB. We have our create because we're going to be creating stuff in CerebralDB. And we're going to be doing query sets, updates. That kind of makes sense, right? And in these files, we built like the core, which is the core, you know, Python, uh, the, the core code in Rust that's actually going to do the operation. Then we kind of had a interface, which is kind of like stuff that we needed data from outside of that module because we try to separate it all. Then we have the Python.rs, and this is the bindings. And this is the stuff we're going to be interested in this talk. And then on the right is all the miscellaneous stuff, which you kind of understand, I guess. You see the Docker file, you see the cargo toml for your, for your um, packages, for Rust. You see the readme, all that sort of stuff, right? That makes sense. And we've got the setup.py. So first of all, we'll move to the setup.py and how do we actually build this? And the cool thing about the setup.py is that we're gonna use the PYO3 bindings. And there's this really you know, cool package called setup tools Rust. So there's some miscellaneous code here of me like getting the the version and reading the readme. But when we look at the setup, we actually have the Rust extension. So we actually have inputs for the setup that say Rust extension equals, and then we actually have the Rust extension that we import from setup, uh, setup tools Rust. And we point to where that is, right? So it's in the Surreal DB, Rust Surreal DB, right? And it's gonna look in the cargo toml, it's gonna compile it, and then it's going to put it in SurrealDB under Rust SurrealDB. So that's going to be its own separate module. And we're going to use the PYO3 binding. That's literally it, right? That's all you need with that thing that we had, that layout that we had earlier. Uh, and it works. You can do a pip install and point to the library. Now, at this stage, you would need Rust as well because it's going to compile it on the fly as it's installing it. But with some wheels, you know, you can create some wheels uh, with GitHub matrices um, and GitHub actions, you can actually compile some wheels as well. So the user doesn't actually have to have Rust installed when they're doing their pip install. Um, I guess we can put some links in or I'll put something in the comments because um, the code is all open source. So you can look at the GitHub actions and see how we actually do it. So if we look at the dependency, we can see here that we we get the whole of Surreal DB and we actually put that in there as well, which is kind of cool. So you have the whole database in as a client. Um, and then we have the Tokyo, which is your async runtimes. We have the CERD for serialization and we have all these other things. Um, we also have the library and we say, look, you can see the library is Rust underscore Surreal DB. That has to correlate with your setup.py because it, because when we compile the library, it's going to be compiled under Rust underscore Surreal DB as the actual binary. Um, and then we say that it's a dynamic library as well. And we also have some dependencies on PYO3 and we say we have to use the extension module uh, as a feature in a certain version as well. So this is the meat of it. And uh, we're good. But now we're here at the, the, the PYO3 bindings, right? So you have this macro that's just a pi function. So you have your function and you can just decorate it as a pi function. So that means it can be imported into Python, and then it can just be run as Python code, which again is, is very simple, right? It's pretty cool. So there's a few things we have to take notes here. There is the lifetime. We do do a py, um, a py any, which means it's any sort of object. And then with these objects, you can kind of inspect them if you want. You can try and downcast them, or you can say, look, I'm passing in a string, and then it is... It is type strict, so if you don't pass in a string uh, from Python into it, it will error. And you can see here that there's a wrapped connection here. And this is something that we have to be really careful about. Um, PYO3 maintains a state, but I can't really put true words to it. I, I wish I was better at describing this. But certain things like, let's say if you have a connection and you leave it in PYO3 in the, in the Rust part, of your module, it will stay there. Let's say you have a global hash map or something and it's wrapped in a mutex uh, and it's static. It will stay there, but the connection will die once you finish running that code. It's not the best thing, but what the way we get around it here is that we wrap the, um, we wrap the connection 
in a struct and we just call it wrapped connection and then we pass it back to the object in python and then we just every time we do a thing every time we do an operation we have to just pass that wrapped connection back so it keeps it live and that's something that i recommend you know if you if you're going to start doing stuff that needs to maintain connections that sort of stuff and then obviously we've got the we've got the key and we've got the value there is something else here and you can see that we've got a runtime we've got a block on and that's because i know most python devs don't really do async and i don't blame them when i write python i don't do that much async either because async io kind of weird it's just like one thread and when you try and do anything else aside from that thread it does it stops you know and i think it's part of the global interpreter lock um different there's different languages for different things you know, I, I would just say, if you're doing async stuff, don't use Python, right? But so our, our async functions in Rust, we kind of have to block them. We have to like block the whole code because if we just send it to the task, we send it to task queue and then we, we disappear out, the task queue will collapse. Just kind of like that wrapped connection. So we've got a runtime and we do a block on it. I have been experimenting with, um, actually build actually running a separate thread and you open it up in a port and it's kind of like a tcp and you can have your own async runtime and it does work but it's a bit you know it's a bit more work right and it is something that i will potentially look into for building like an async runtime that's powered by rust but can be interfaced by python that's something that excites me and always happy for collaborations if someone wants to reach out on that so once we get to the lib.irs, you can see that we we import our, our functions that were wrapped in that Python, you know, it had that Python macro on it, uh, well, that Py function macro, sorry. And then you can see that we create our Py module, which is Rust underscore Surreal DB. And uh, we wrap the, the function, and then that's just ready to be imported. So once this is fused with your Rust, with your Python code, you can then say from rust underscore surreal db um, import and then you can do blocking make connection blocking sign in you can Im import all these and start using them right and we've got some examples but we'll just go through how we handle a connection as well so in our connection we use a singleton um, so we kind of do some meta classing and uh, what this is is inherits from type and then this is used as a meta class, so it has the instances. And that means that every time it gets called, it will check the instances first to see if it's there and it will get it from there. Um, if it's not there, it will create a new connection. So that means that you're not constantly just creating new connections every time you're calling. Uh, this is just pure Python. So I, I love meta classing. I highly recommend people look into it. And um, this is just a bit of extra code, but I think we're getting into the weeds a bit, so we'll skip that. And then here we are, so we get into like the surreal DB um, main object that you that you uh, that you import and you use, and you can see that we've got the meta class, which is a connection controller. So that means that you can just call this surreal DB object again anywhere in your code, and the init won't fire again. It will just get the same instance from the same memory address. <clears throat> then we created some mixins, and I decided on mixins because. Um, it just it's just easier to slot in and out. So we've got create mixing, sign in mixing, X Y Z, right? And they just kind of have the functions that we we do for our connections. You can see that we have a make connection here. So an example would be so we just want to see actually how our code works. <clears throat> so sadly, you've got the underlining in the screenshot, and that is just purely because we're importing the code from the Rust <clears throat> like uh, binary. And uh, it just obviously doesn't recognize that in this uh, in this LSP server in VS Code. Uh, it does if you've done a pip install, but if you're developing and you've got your code next to each other, it's not compiled and talking to it, so it's not going to be able to map it. Um, and you can see that we just do that from Surreal DB, uh, you know, Rust underscore Surreal DB, and then we import our functions because that's our module that we defined. And then you can see we just call them like we we call functions. And we can also see the same with a query mixin as well. <clears throat> so, so that's 
that's pretty much it, right? Once so you can see that you can start to build some very basic stuff. You can you can get running tomorrow really if you if you want to have a look. And again, we'll put a link because it's all open source code, and you can kind of see how it how it works, how we build the setup, how we do the um, the the Pi functions, how we wrap them, and then how we how we import them in in Python code. So there's a few other things we can see. This is the Tokyo runtime. So Tokyo is async to the to the Python uh, developers. This is our async runtime that's used quite a lot. There's a bit of a battle going on at the minute. If you read Reddit, there's people that are kind of angry that Tokyo is kind of taking over, uh, and that there's other Python run uh, Rust runtimes that should uh, have more of a spotlight. And then there's others saying we should just throw in a towel and we should just have Tokyo just be the standard and I'm not going to obviously have an opinion on that. But uh, for this example, we're just using Tokyo. And uh, you can see that we use the static and we use the lazy, just like we did with the fearless concurrency example. And we build our async runtime and we use the new current thread. So that means we use one thread. We don't want to have loads of threads consumed because we're doing, um, we're just doing one call anyway and then blocking because we, we have blocking code in Python. So that is essentially it. That is how we actually build, you know, modules that can be installed with pip. Um, but that's not the only method. And uh, I so there are other ways. So we've done the piping. That's how you do it. We've done the modules that you can install in pip. And this is another one. Um, we can't shoot me too much on this. My 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 day job and that is that you can actually build custom modules for uh, redis but i do stress obviously surreal db is a better choice than redis but uh, if you want to build custom modules in redis uh, this is what we're going to cover now so if you, so for i've used this in the past when i've been building some microservices and a, a really good example is let's say that we we want to do something where um we want to check the state of a user and we want to see if they've timed out and stuff like this. If you are using Redis Cache, you may have to do multiple calls to the database. Whereas if you actually build your Rust module inside Redis, you just do one call, it'll do a series of things that you've coded and then it'll give you that one thing back, right? So it's just one call, which is obviously a huge, uh, huge update. So this is like, a, this is a Docker image of what you would do if you wanted to do this. And the ones that I've commented out are if you want to actually incorporate Python into it, because that's what this talk is about. But if you don't want to incorporate Python, you just want to build a pure Rust module, then you just leave those commented out. And um, you can see that you build your release and uh, then you copy over your, your module and then you do, you can see here Redis server, and then you load your module as well. So that gets loaded into your Redis. And you can see on the left of this, this is the cargo toml. So this is where we have the session modules, which is user session models. Um, then we have the crate type, which is again, it's a dynamic one. And we've got the dependencies where we need to have Redis module. And in this one, I'm seeing if the user is timed out. So I'm using Chrono. And, um, here we can see that we can define our redis module in our lib.rs and uh, i've got a few commands that i have where it's like login set log out set because you want to log out a user update to say you want to update the user's last interacted time update role because in this one the user has multiple different roles and you can see that i've built some some basic functions that i import and then they get defined there so if we look at some of this code, we can see that there is like um, this is a this is a string set, right? And what we can do is we 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 look at the args that come in because in Redis you put in a series of args, and uh, we want to make sure that you've put the right amount of args for this for this function. If you don't, then we say okay, you know that's not that's not good. And you can see here that we get like a Redis string, and then we create it, and then we get a redis context and then we start to write so if the key is empty then we say look the user isn't found and then there's a function that's obviously off this because i don't want to swamp you with just tons of code you're more interested in how this works as opposed to how my code works um my own custom user session i check to see if there's a timeout uh, and based on a certain cutoff time and if it is then i'll return saying 
that it's been timed out. If it hasn't, then I return saying, look, it's fine. Um, and then if for some reason neither of those come out, then it's a bit of an error, but I want that return to say we couldn't check the timeout. Um, and then you can say that we update the last interacted. Then we can say we can get like a key from the from the hash set for that user. Uh, we convert it to string and then we send it back. So you always just get the role when you just do one database call, right? So so one database call and it checks to see if you've timed out, checks if it's there, checks, and then it gets you the role back. And it updates the time as well, whereas you'd have to do multiple database calls for that. So that's why you do these um, database modules. So we can also see that we've done something similar here, but we're kind of getting Python running in Redis. So we use the PYO3 again, like we did with our with our pip modules. And then we check the args and then we iterate through the args because we want to say, look, we want to have at least three args for this for this um, function. Uh, and this is like to set the string. And um, in 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 the PYO3, we get the Python. So we get the Python interpreter with the, when we acquire the gil. And then you can see that like we do the import sys and then we get the version, which is basically, and, and that's gonna be a string, right? And then these locals are kind of like data that you can feed in and out of each Python execution. And then we've got some code. So we're gonna get the EMV user, we're gonna get the EMV username. And uh, then we're gonna do Python eval. So it's gonna it's gonna get those locals, uh, the, that those, you know, that data that we have into PyDict. So it's a dictionary of data. We pass that in. So you can get data from your Rust code, and then you get your code that you've written, and then you do a Python evaluation, right? And then you get something out of it, which is the user and the version. So that's where those evaluations, those locals are gonna be repopulated, and we're gonna have user and version from that Python code, you know, that we, we've got. So when you print it, it will, it will come out, and that will be, the final example, I think. Um, I think there's just one more, sorry. No, that's it. So um, so here you are, so we're running it. You can see Redis starting, um, you can see configuration loaded, uh, and then you can see that the module strings loaded from lib session module, so I've loaded my module with that, with that Docker image. Um, and then you can see, hello unknown, I'm Python 3.9. Uh, and then this is this is done here, and then it prints out some other things. These are your keys. This is your thing. So that is that is it really. So we've covered that you have you can you can pipe between Rust and Python. Just use basic piping in your Bash. Uh, you can build modules that can be installed with pip using the PYO3 bindings, and you can also fuse your Python with Rust if you just embed it directly into your Redis as well. Uh, which is also quite powerful in its sense. Um, just a, you know, you can contact me obviously through SurrealDB on the Discord um, or on my website. Um, in terms of what I'm currently working on, I am currently working on embedding machine learning into uh, SurrealDB. And uh, this is just a call out in terms of if anyone wants to collaborate in this because this is something that I'm very passionate about in terms of. There's a lot of really like hyped up AI declarations in the space, but uh, I, you know, in terms of working in SurrealDB, we kind of work with collaborating directly with people who actually have machine learning into production, and uh, that is so we can actually just do the boring stuff correctly, right, and actually add value. So um, we're doing direct matrix multiplication and fusing PyTorch into uh, SurrealDB, so it's now fused in there, and uh, we're now extracting pure weights so we can do decision trees and random forests actually through pure matrix multiplication. And that's, uh, that's the final thing that we're working on. So hopefully people feel excited and Python developers are like, yes, I wanna use Rust and I wanna fuse it with my Python. That's, and uh, yeah, that's it really. So um, the the question is, uh, machine learning is Python based mainly. So where would we use Rust in the machine yes. learning? I would like some uh, use case 
for introducing Rust in the stack of machine learning? Oh, a use case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, I guess really it's uh, interoperability in terms of, let's say, inference. So that's where we're mainly working in Surreal DB. Is we're not. It's a database, right? So we're not trying to train the models. Um, it's more: can we extract the pure weights, and can we just? And we we kept the bindings really thin. Python bindings really thin, and everything's in Rust. So that means that we can add JavaScript bindings. We can compile it to Wasm, so it can go run in the browser. That sort of thing. So interoperability is like a really big thing, because then you don't have to have an entire like. Python interpreter to run your models. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting things we're doing with Microsoft called the Hummingbird thing, uh, and where they've managed to do the math to convert decision trees and random forests into pure matrix modifications, which is, uh, I think that's really cool. All completely in Rust. And uh, well, if it's pure matrix modifications, yeah, then you can you can put it into Rust. It will be Rust, and then from, from upper layer, you can have. Uh, uh, two things or a service that is Rust, and then from the other side, a stack application or a web application that gets things, or you can use a, a Py or free for mm. binding to Python, correct? Yeah, or you, or with WebAssembly, you can put it into the browser because because Rust works really well with WebAssembly in that sense. Um, so, th so there's that. Then there's the basic. Um, there's a polars, which is kind of like pandas, but it's written in Rust, so it's just faster. Polars. Yeah, but it also has like Python binding. So, um, but in terms of the training, I mean, in terms of again performance, how much do you gain? F how much do we gain in terms of Python C or in Rust? Gain in terms of performance. Training performance, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I would say, when it comes to training, there's these really mature libraries like PyTorch and stuff, and they, they okay. working really well with the CUDA, and so yeah. I, I mean, I wish I could tell you that you get better ones on there, but that that kind of domain is already conquered. You know, um, it's more the inference. Uh, there and the storage because we want to try and get away from because everyone's everyone claims that they use like pure weights in TensorFlow and stuff like this but most people I've seen um, under the hood they kind of just pickle their objects and store them you know um, which obviously has its own problems if you update you serialization. yeah but but save tensors yeah yeah so so saving the tensors is a good idea but I've what I've seen in, in a lot of industry is they just generally end up pickling their models, which has its own errors where if you update the Python version and you get you can get potential errors and all this sort of thing. Uh, oh, and also is is a graph you, you do most of the time you don't need to, to serialize all all the dependency graph dependency of of the structure. So basically um, and most of the time you need to serialize just two fields, two fields of can be also that a class so uh, yeah it's, it's also it's a security issue because mm. you can serialize malicious code so it's like the pickle uh, bombs yes. so <laughs> in hugging face they have a rust library to do this safe test source if i'm not mistaken format uh, so which is basically you can write to it and it just contains the weights or whatever but doesn't contain any code and it's uh you can interface with that from Rust. So, so load any hugging face models directly from Rust, I think. From the point of view of innovation, you have all the stack with TensorFlow, PyTorch, and so on, and this is part of feminine industry, and I suspect that it's G++, so it will never uh, move away to Rust, so or it will be very difficult. Yeah, maybe yeah. the storage, maybe you can, or the computation, for the point of computation, in that engineering you have a Spark, but now in Rust we have also that fusion. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty cool, yeah. Um, uh, and this may be the point, and uh, from the point of uh, simply algorithms interacting with, uh, with Python, 
like a forest tree, urban forest, uh, or SVM and so on. Uh, like are there, if they are not distributed, uh, they, I think they will work well in clusters. Yeah, well, I guess for, for inference only, you can, using Rust, you can bring this machine learning into more places than you would with Python. Mm -hmm. Uh, like as like embedded or uh, browsers as you mentioned so I think having this inference part at least uh, usable uh -huh. from Rust then you can save memory and have very good performance and, yes. and also <laughs> portability that you can't have with Python uh, you mean the edge yeah the edge, the edge? For, the, for, for the inference itself but for building models yeah I think as you said it's all <laughs> composed by Python at the, time yeah, at the edge uh, yeah. you were worth in work in C++ or Rust to could uh, yeah, there, there uh, some cases and have a, a better consolidation of it. Yeah, it's like I said, how, how in face they have Rust libraries to serialize the serialized models uh, just exactly for this kind of speed and safety and portability. Um, yeah. Th there, yeah, there's there 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 independent there's, there's, um, there's another one that's just been released, a crate called Candle, and it's uh, the guy who built the the bindings for PyTorch and Rust is building this, and it's essentially no runtime, and it's pure Rust, and it just means that you get the hugging face models and just directly execute them. You might want also, if it's needed, the data pipeline for Rust, but the data pipeline in Rust, uh, data pipeline it will be one of the few first things that chat GPT we replace humans uh, because they are completely discreditive. So, you know, uh, do this phase uh, or data cleaning and then do the other, and uh, they are completely declarative. Actually. You might want also we Rust if you want to have a big load, but most of them now nowadays use Spark, and so Spark is <coughs> Python or mm. Scala. So, yeah, and, it, and it's the uh, distributed computing and GPUs as well. It's just the support they have yeah, for that level. Yeah, so mm -hmm. so. My Microsoft is Rust. Microsoft Yeah, also played with LLM RS, so you can load some LLM models. Uh, and and I think yes. It's actually what just a Rust. Is. It's a Rust wrapper around a C library. Or C++, mm -hmm. but it's a kind of a kind of compiles it in, so it doesn't it doesn't you don't even know that <laughs> you just install it from crates and you can play with different LLM models on your PC or laptop or uh, mm -hmm. you don't need a very beefy computer to get something out of it. Because uh, all the people they are speaking about uh, yeah, the future replacement of C++ will be Rust, but it's hard to allow that point. It's, it, it, I would be more happy because the ecosystem of uh, Rust is far, far superior that from the point of view of contribution, packages, <laughs> installation, you don't have any ages, so you just cargo new uh, something less uh, or cargo install uh, like that. But to arrive at that point, uh, we need to see time, I think, three, four years. Yeah, it's, it's insane. I was uh, I was saying to some of the other guys um, before you came that so in two weeks' time we're, we're doing a talk in London and uh, the like um, VP of engineering of you know like a uh, Barclays and you know, head of pricing at Vanguard and stuff. They're all interested in uh, one in, in adopting of Rust. Is trading because the code of trading C plus plus or meta programming most of them. And is multi involved, so so the amountability of that is very very hard and tough. So you need it. And the other point that is now you couldn't use it is blockchain. Mm -hmm. All the blockchain you want to see are Rust please. Yeah, blockchain is cool or Rust Rust yeah. Yeah, yeah, all this uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain stuff. In London, there's a company called Rust based. Curado that does uh, agreement with the Equal Development and they pay these kind of electronic coins on, and they are completely Rust. I, I think a big part of that is there's no legacy code. 
so say if you've got in those yeah, fields, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you get yeah. to use it, yeah. And it has great properties for what they need, which is safety and speed. Um, safety, speed, and and then uh, performance. Because hmm. it's, it's, it's hard. I'd love to get a conversation with maybe I will mean, source you again, Matthew, but some people that are using Rust in production across a couple of companies, you maybe too. Because yeah. I keep getting, I get a lot of different stories from people. Some people say it's really slow and the teams aren't getting pulled out, but it's rock solid when it gets there. Oh, sorry, yeah. We, so we, we've got some audience questions. Sorry, oh, yeah. Okay, cool. um, so uh, sorry about this. Um, so any audience questions? Uh, yeah, that's what you said. And then it says, does uh, this reduce the server costs when accessing um, and bigger models? Does what reduce the server costs? Are we just saying, I, I guess I can try and just guess um, a few scenarios of what would reduce the server costs. If you're just inferring in Rust, um, uh, then yes, it will reduce the, the server costs if it's just pure Rust. Um, and again, anything that's kind of running Rust inference, it will, it will reduce the server costs by by huge margins. Um, it, it's like uh, I, I can't remember the the studies where it's like we're looking at roughly if you look at Python servers, they're about like for this benchmark, it was at like eleven thousand requests per second, and then with the Rust servers, it was going over a million for the same hardware and so on. Uh, so you would, yeah, you definitely save. In other part that is going on, that they make sense, I have serverless in Rust. Yeah, because it's a quick startup time, isn't it? Not quite fully supported yet, though. Our last week's talk this was. Is the reason we don't have like US on the server, unless it's, it's Rust at the moment. 